The office of President of the United States can be a very dangerous job. Four times in our nation's history, an assassin shot and killed the president. Two others injured by bullets. Other plots fail. Guns misfired or bullets missed. Bombs malfunction. In nearly all those cases, we know conclusively what happened. The culprit caught and prosecuted. All those cases, except one. There were three loud reverberating explosions. Suddenly, the Secret Service men sprang into action. The convertible bearing the president and Mrs. Kennedy sped away. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy in Dallas on November 22, 1963, happened in front of hundreds of witnesses, and it was captured by home movie cameras from several angles. Within days, before all the evidence could be gathered and analyzed, the administration began pushing the narrative that a former U.S. Marine, communist sympathizer and misfit, Lee Harvey Oswald, acted alone. Yet questions about a second shooter have lingered for decades. Now, from his home in remote Northern California, a world-renowned JFK researcher and private detective, Josiah Tink Thompson, has written a new book, the culmination of his life's work, Last Second in Dallas, a painstaking examination of the forensic evidence that comes to a shocking conclusion about who killed President Kennedy. He was not killed by Oswald. We know that. Thompson's book includes new information that points to a second gunman, a debris field of blood and bone from the president in two distinct directions, remnants of a second type of bullet found in Kennedy's brain, and an updated analysis of the gunfire recorded by a motorcycle officer's open microphone that day. It may be too late for justice in this case, but it's never too late for the truth. We need the truth. We have returned to the site of the assassination, Dealey Plaza, and spoken to experts. They made a concerted effort to dupe the world. Historians. It's a Shakespearean tragedy played out in, in real life. And the witnesses who were closest to the president. I thought that those shots could have been coming right across the top of our heads. When he suffered that fatal shot. I knew then it was a rifle shot. So that's when I jumped from the car and started to run. All this shedding new light on JFK. It's the great American murder mystery, isn't it? And what happened during his last second alive that proves the real conspiracies. One to kill the president, others to cover up what actually happened. It's important for people to understand that something this big can happen, and your government may not tell you the truth about it. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, nicknamed Jack, represented a new beginning for the White House and the nation when he became president at the age of 43. He was the youngest man ever elected to the office and also the first president born in the 20th century. Stephen Fagan is curator of the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. Mr. Kennedy and his wife, Jacqueline, come to the White House where they are greeted by President Eisenhower. This was in stark contrast to Dwight Eisenhower, who was a much more grandfatherly figure to the United States. Suddenly, you had this young, glamorous couple in the White House with these two great kids. They were admired internationally. And so there was a celebrity status afforded to the Kennedys that a political family had never seen before. By the time Jack Kennedy took office, Josiah Thompson had wrapped up service in the U.S. Navy's Underwater Demolition Team, or UDT. I didn't like being on ships. Pretty silly thing to join the Navy and not like ships, but I didn't like being on ships. So I volunteered for Underwater Demolition Team training. Frogman. Yeah, frog But the precursor to the Navy SEALs. Absolutely right. The SEAL Team 2 was made up of cadres from UDT-21, which was my unit. 
After missions in the Middle East, Thompson left the Navy, attended Yale University as a graduate student, and taught in the philosophy department. He watched JFK weather several crises, a crackdown on organized crime, appointing his brother, Robert F. Kennedy, as attorney general. The Bay of Pigs, when American-trained Cuban exiles tried to overthrow Fidel Castro but failed. The clashes of the burgeoning civil rights movement the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis, when an American U-2 spy plane photographed Russian missiles being assembled just 100 miles from the Florida coast. That was an enormously dangerous time for the whole country, for the whole world, as, as a matter of fact. The leaders on both sides had been well terrified by what almost happened. Here comes the big jet in. Nearing the end of a tumultuous first term, the president traveled to Dallas for what many considered to be the beginning of his re-election campaign. You see the crowd pushing in from the side of the street. You see people hanging out of the windows. He's riding in a limo that doesn't have a scrap of armor on it. The bubble isn't on there, but of course the bubble wasn't bulletproof or bullet resistant. Looking back, there were very few precautions in terms of protecting him from those crowds. I think that's true. I don't think a president will ever travel as unprotected as Kennedy did that, that day in Dallas. Secret Service right along with the president, of course. At that time, there were 200 Secret Service agents nationwide, and only about 34 that protected President Kennedy on a, on a full-time basis. By comparison, today we have uh, 3,200 Secret Service agents. In other words, the Secret Service has grown 16 times since the day of the Kennedy assassination. So you have to take that into consideration. They simply did not have the manpower to effectively guard every rooftop, every window. What was your assignment that day? Were you actually assigned to the First Lady or to the President or? Assigned to Mrs. Kennedy. You're the primary agent responsible for her safety, so you were, you were right with her the entire time. All the time. I was always on her side or right behind her, as near as I could be. Secret Service agent Clint Hill served under five presidents. During the Dallas motorcade, he stood on the running board outside the driver's door on the Secret Service car right behind the limousine carrying President Kennedy, the First Lady, Texas Governor John Conley, and his wife Nellie. Down Main Street, right on Houston, left on Elm, past the Texas School Book Depository. I was looking around, gazing, looking at the crowd on the left, and ahead of us was an overpass, and I could see nothing wrong. And then I heard this explosive noise over my right shoulder. So I started to turn toward it to see if I could identify it, because it, it didn't really sound like a rifle shot. It sounded more like a firecracker or something. There was some echo because of the buildings around there. But when I started to turn to my right to get to the point where I could see what it was, my vision crossed the back of the president's car. And then all of a sudden he grabbed at his throat and he started to fall to his left. I knew then it was a rifle shot. So that's when I jumped from the car and started to run. The scene, captured by Abraham Zapruder, owner of a dress manufacturing business near Dealey Plaza. He left work and walked across the street with his Bell & Howe 8 mm home movie camera to see the presidential motorcade. It was of a new and very excellent design at the time. Zapruder couldn't have chosen a better vantage point, high up on this pedestal. And when the limo got to the closest point, the fatal shot rang out. And I got to the, almost to the president's car when I heard another shot and I felt that one and I saw the reaction. It hit the president in the head and it was blood matter, brain matter, bone fragments, all came out of that wound, got all over the back of the car and all over me and all over Mrs. Kennedy because she at that point had gotten up on the back of the trunk trying to grasp some of the material that came out of the president's head, which she was able to do. So I got up on top of the president's car and I grabbed her and put her in the back seat. When I did that, his body fell farther to the left with his head in her lap. The right side of his face was up. I could see the hole in the skull and in that hole, there was no brain matter left. There was nothing there, it was just a vacuum. I thought this is a fatal shot. So I turned to the follow-up car and I gave him a thumbs down. The motorcade sped toward Parkland Hospital three miles away, 
On arrival, the president still had a pulse. But 20 minutes later, doctors pronounced him dead. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You'll excuse the fact that I'm out of breath, but about 10 or 15 minutes ago, a tragic thing from all indications at this point has happened in the city of Dallas. Governor Conley had also been shot, but would recover from his injuries. His wife appeared before the cameras later that day, revealing the last word she spoke to President Kennedy just before the gunfire. I just had such a good feeling about the, the way they had received him in this city. I had just turned around and said to him, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you, Mr. President. That was it. As the news spread and the nation reeled, the hunt began for a killer. Some witnesses pointed toward a rise in Dealey Plaza next to the motorcade route, the grassy knoll, and rushed there, along with police from the motorcade. Other witnesses saw a rifle fire from the Texas School Book Depository building. An officer actually had 24-year-old Lee Harvey Oswald at gunpoint just after the assassination, but let him go. Lee Harvey Oswald is first seen about 90 seconds after the last shot is fired. He's seen in the lunchroom on the second floor of the school book depository. A Dallas police motorcycle officer named Marion Baker dropped his motorcycle, rushed in the building, got a hold of the building's manager, Roy Truly. They go up through the building. They find Oswald. Why didn't he uh, arrest him then? Because the manager of the place told us that he was an employee. He said, he's all right, he's an employee. So Baker holsters his weapon and they go on up the stairs. Oswald buys a coat from the coat machine and ostensibly walks out the front door of the building before it's sealed off by investigators. Dallas police found a sniper's nest on the sixth floor. Boxes stacked near an open window overlooking the motorcade route and three spent shell casings. On the other side of the same floor, stashed between boxes, they found this Italian bolt-action military rifle that Oswald had purchased mail order for 1995. After leaving the book depository, Oswald went to his boarding house, retrieved a jacket and handgun, and a few blocks away, encountered Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett. Next thing you know, that officer was shot and killed. Then there was a movie theater near there where that happened, and the the gal who was selling tickets noticed this guy run and go in rapidly and never didn't bought a ticket. And so she called the police. And as I approached him about one foot from him, he jumped out of his seat and held his hands up and says, this is it. And uh, he hit me uh, in the face with his fist, blooding my nose, and I immediately grabbed him. And he went for his gun that was in his waist. Oswald tries to shoot a police officer inside the theater, actually pulls the trigger. The officer puts his hand down on top of the weapon to stop the uh, firing pin. And they scuffle with Oswald. He gets cut above his eye. He's under arrest. There is the very quick film of the movement of Oswald out of the theater. A policeman hit me. He goes to Dallas Police Headquarters. It's not until he's there at Dallas Police Headquarters that the police determine He's the missing employee from the Texas School Book Depository. During that weekend, Dallas police took the extraordinary step of parading Oswald before the cameras, trying to satisfy the crush of reporters. Did you kill the president? No, I've not been charged with that. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. Uh, the first thing I heard about it was when the newspaper reporters in the hall uh, asked me that question. Two days after the assassination, Dallas police were transferring Oswald from the city jail to the county jail on live television when Jack Ruby emerged with a 38 caliber revolver. This is the basement floor of the Dallas City Hall, and that's a scuffle on the basement floor. It seems to concern the target. He has been happen. shot. Oswald has been shot. Ruby had easy access to police headquarters because he owned a strip club and a bar frequented by officers. Yes. Hey, Edgar Hoover on 2192. As the FBI director explained to the new president, Lyndon Johnson. He knew all the police uh, in that white light district where the joints are down there. And he also uh, let them come in, see the show, get food and get liquor and so forth. That's how I think he got into police headquarters. Uh, because uh, they accepted him as kind of a police character hanging around police headquarters. 
Hoover also explained how Dallas police put their suspect, Lee Harvey Oswald, in danger to accommodate the media. Secondly, the chief of police admits that he uh, moved him in the morning uh, as a convenience and at the request of the motion picture people who wanted to have daylight. He should have moved him at night, but he didn't. Ruby testified that he shot Oswald to spare the First Lady the pain of returning to Dallas for a murder trial, and that the JFK assassination affected him deeply. I was so emotionally upset for three days. Ruby himself got convicted of murder, won an appeal for a new trial, but before it could happen, died of cancer. His attorney interviewed Ruby on his deathbed at Parkland Hospital, the same place where President Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald died. Ruby stuck to the story that he had no memory of shooting Oswald. It happened so fast and everything else, I can't recall what had happened from the time I came to the bottom of the ramp until the police officers had me on the ground. I have no recollection, no. But I know that they were holding my hand, grappling for the gun. The day after Ruby killed Oswald, Mrs. Kennedy buried her husband. In just 18 hours, 250,000 people filed past the president lying in state at the U.S. Capitol. Many world leaders attended the funeral and walked in the procession, but they were eclipsed by a three-year-old boy, John F. Kennedy Jr., saluting as his father's casket passed. Then, the president's widow lit the eternal flame at Arlington National Cemetery. The death of JFK's suspected killer meant the end of the criminal investigation, and as a result, Josiah Thompson says, we lost critical evidence in the case forever. In ordinary murder investigations, all sorts of records of evidence have to be held by the prosecution and safeguarded because evidence is sacrosanct in any investigation. That's how you find, find out the truth. In this case, As soon as Oswald was killed in Dallas Police Headquarters on Sunday, all the various restrictions, etc., on evidence were relaxed. The recordings for the Dallas Police radio were given out as souvenirs by the dispatchers of the Dallas Police. There's even a a recording that was part of a, that was given out in a magazine, right? Yeah, a girly magazine, as a matter of fact. (laughs) Yes, right, yeah. The first shot was fired three seconds after an officer says, All right, Jackson. A recording of the assassination captured by a stuck microphone on a Dallas police motorcycle. That will play an important role in our understanding decades later of what really happened in Dealey Plaza. Ninety-nine minutes after doctors pronounced John F. Kennedy dead, Lyndon Baines Johnson took the oath of office aboard Air Force One parked on the runway at Love Field Airport in Dallas. Jacqueline Kennedy by his side, still wearing that pink jacket spattered with her husband's blood. His first presidential order to the flight crew. Now let's get airborne. Johnson almost immediately, according to his uh, advisors and Secret Service agents, almost immediately he suspected there could be some type of conspiracy. That was why he wanted to immediately leave Dallas and get back to Washington, because he thought this could be part of a larger plot. But President Johnson did not discuss his personal beliefs in public, even when information surfaced that Lee Harvey Oswald lived in the Soviet Union for three years, had a Russian wife, and that he visited the Russian and Cuban embassies in Mexico less than two months before the JFK assassination. In fact, according to this internal CIA memo, Oswald met with the head of the Russian embassy, Valery Kostikov, who also served in the KGB's 13th department, responsible for sabotage and assassination. 
Imagine if Lyndon Johnson went on national television and told the American public that he felt that the Soviet Union or Cuba was involved in a plot to assassinate their president, John F. Kennedy. We would have had World War III right there. In the days just after the assassination, before the evidence could be collected and analyzed, the Johnson administration decided on a narrative. Oswald had to be the lone gunman. Oswald was the guy, he was the lone gunman, before they really, all the evidence came in. Is, is that how you see it as well? Well, sure, that's what happened. And the fact that he was shot and killed on the 24th, why, that didn't help matters. I mean, we really wanted to talk to the guy, and we never had that opportunity. The federal government immediately decided, for reasons of state, that there was a single assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, that that would be the story. Internal memos and recordings surfaced years later, showing how quickly that decision came after President Kennedy's death. On the same day as the funeral, Deputy Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach sent this memo to the new Johnson White House. The public must be satisfied that Oswald was the assassin, that he did not have Confederates who are still at large, and that evidence was such that he would have been convicted at trial. It continues. Speculation about Oswald's motivation ought to be cut off and we should have some basis for rebutting thought that this was a communist conspiracy or, as the Iron Curtain Press is saying, a right-wing conspiracy to blame it on the communists. Unfortunately, the facts on Oswald seem about too pat, too obvious. Marxist, Cuba, Russian wife, etc. In that memo, Katzenbach points out that the very integrity of the U.S. government is being brought into question by this that the people in the United States have to be assured beyond any reasonable doubt that there was only Oswald. There were no conspirators, nothing beyond that. And then in, in the, again, at the end of his memo, he recommends a commission. Well, that's exactly what happened. Hello. Senator Russell, 2191. Just days after that memo, President Johnson called his friend, Senator Richard Russell of Georgia, to serve on a commission to be named after the man heading it, Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren. But I, I couldn't say that was Chief Justice Warren. I, I don't like that man. But the senator relented after pressure from President Johnson, who implored that it's for the good of America. We got to take this out of the arena where they're testifying at Khrushchev and Castro did this and did that and uh, kicking us into a war that can kill 40 million Americans in an hour. There was definitely an incentive at that time to wrap it up nice and neat, one lone disenchanted young man who worked here in the school book depository and had a rifle that day. It's unsatisfying, but it's a much more simplistic explanation that would not bring us to the brink of war with the Soviet Union at that time. But was the mission the truth, or was the mission to keep things calm? It's easy to look back at the Warren Commission investigation in 64 as this kind of uh, blue ribbon panel that was just meant to rubber stamp uh, a conclusion that was already set in stone prior to it. Historian Stephen Fagan believes, at least at the staff level, the Warren Commission sought the truth no matter where it led. But, Josiah Thompson tells us, the commission had its marching orders from President Johnson from the start. Focus on Oswald. Do not implicate Cuba or Russia. And that would, of course, prompt a major confrontation between the Soviet Union and the U.S., perhaps leading to war. So he's steering the commission already, early on. Absolutely. And just to put a fine point on this, the mission of the Warren Commission wasn't the truth. No. The mission of the Warren Commission, simply put, was the prosecution of Oswald. There wasn't any defense. If you do a prosecution with no defense, this is what you get. The Warren Commission was also hamstrung by the FBI and CIA. Both agencies intentionally misled investigators, withholding the fact that they monitored Oswald in the months before the assassination. In April of that same year, he used his Carcano rifle in Dallas to shoot at a strident anti-communist, U.S. Army Major General Edwin Walker, according to Oswald's widow. Another challenge for the commission? We now know Chief Justice Warren suppressed key evidence based on his close friendship with the Kennedy family. 
He denied access to the autopsy photos and refused to allow interviews to explore Oswald's Mexico connections. The end result? An incomplete investigation at best, at worst, a cover-up about the JFK assassination. Why should this be important for all of us to understand uh, what actually happened that day? Because if a society believes in alternative facts, you get in deeper and deeper trouble. You need the truth. A healthy society needs the truth. And this is a little truth that I can help with. This view of the simulated motorcade is through a four-power, 18-millimeter Ordnance Optical Incorporated rifle scope, the same make and model scope that was used by the assassin. The U.S. Secret Service blocked off Dealey Plaza for the Warren Commission to reenact the killing of President Kennedy. They showed how Oswald hid behind boxes of books on the sixth floor of the depository how he tracked the presidential limousine from the open window, how he had to wait until it cleared a tree before he opened fire. In a moment, you can see the tree blocking the view of the car for a split second. The shot that struck the president's neck occurred shortly after the car comes into view from behind the tree, and the shot that struck his head when he was about 85 feet down the road. Ten months after the assassination, the Warren Commission delivered its final report to the White House, 888 pages, finding no conspiracy, domestic or international, that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Officially, there were three shots fired. According to the Warren Commission, one shot missed, one shot caused seven wounds between President Kennedy and Governor Connolly, and then the fatal shot struck the president in the head. That single bullet theory is a source of controversy to this day. The Warren Commission concluded this bullet in near pristine condition found on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital had entered the president's upper back five and three quarter inches below his collar, exited at the knot in his necktie, hit the governor's back near his right armpit, shattered his fifth rib, exited under his right nipple, shattered his right wrist, and wound up embedded in his left thigh. President Johnson did not believe it. Well, we've got your pretty good report. Here, once again, he speaks with Senator Richard Russell, who served on the Warren Commission. The, committee be the commission believes that the same bullet that hit Kennedy hit Connolly. Well, I don't believe it. I don't either. And so I couldn't sign it. And I, I said that Governor Connolly testified directly to the contrary, and I'm not going to approve of that. So I finally made them say there was a difference in the commission in that. Part of them believed that that, uh, that wasn't so. Governor Connolly's account remained consistent over the years, that he heard the first shot, turned to see the president react to being hit in the neck, and then was shot himself. Here he spoke with ABC News Nightline on the assassination's 25th anniversary. There were three shots fired, there's no question about that, and uh, the, the president got hit by the first one, I got hit by the second, and he got hit by the third. Conley was even blunter in private, telling veteran journalist Doug Thompson in 1982 he never believed a word of the Warren Commission report, that he didn't believe Oswald fired the shot that killed JFK, and that he never spoke out because I love this country and we needed closure at the time. But the Warren Commission did not provide closure for most Americans. Well, according to Gallup polls that have been done over the years, I mean, essentially there has never been a moment when less than half of the American public didn't believe in a conspiracy. And those numbers have, have fluctuated really between 60% all the way up to 80%. In addition to the final report, the Warren Commission's 26 volumes of interviews, hearing transcripts, FBI reports, and evidence photographs fueled the debate. Researchers uh, take advantage of that raw data and they begin to find um, inconsistencies, lingering questions. And so you have almost immediately a first generation of critical researchers come to the surface. And Josiah Thompson was a big part of that. He was part of that first generation of Kennedy assassination researchers who have sort of looked on as living legends uh, today among, among assassination researchers. Josiah Thompson had questions about the Warren Commission from the start. The witnesses they did not interview, the evidence they ignored, including that horrible moment caught on film, Zapruder frame 313. 311, this is 312. Notice 312 is really clear. 
it's, it's preternaturally clear. Somehow the, the film lined up with the lens just perfectly. But na now look what happens. 313, there's an explosion in Kennedy's head. That's the climax of the film. It was never mentioned in the Warren Report or its 26 volumes. You wouldn't know it happened. The Warren Commission did publish still frames from the Zapruder film in the volumes of evidence, but something had changed. The head explodes in 313. 314 looked very strange to the educated eye, and so did 315. It turned out they had been reversed. That what is obviously in the original film, a movement like this, is made to look like a forward movement. A forward movement that would support the lone gunman theory. A shot fired from behind, from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Now, J. Edgar Hoover was asked about that, and we have his response to that, and he said this was just a regrettable printing error. So, what you have is the actual evidence, which still to this day is major evidence of a shot striking the president from the right front, is first ignored, nowhere is it, is it mentioned what really happened, and the two critical frames are reversed to make a backward movement look like a forward one. Soon after the Warren Commission report, Josiah Thompson's passing interest in the JFK assassination would turn into a serious investigation, but only after a chance meeting in jail after a Vietnam War protest. January of 1966, the Vietnam War raged. The number of American casualties soared. President Johnson vowed to press on during his State of the Union speech. I believe that we can continue the great society while we fight in Vietnam. Opposition to the war grew. The movement's theme song by Berkeley's Country Joe McDonald. Josiah Thompson also took a stand against the war that January, after becoming a professor at Haverford College near Philadelphia. The sheriff of Delaware County announced that if any of these goddamn peaceniks come into my jurisdiction, I'm going to bust them, right? Thompson and a colleague went, handed out anti-war leaflets, and got arrested. An ACLU attorney arrived to get them out of jail. He talked to his new clients as the officers listened. And he looks at his watch. I thought that was a great move. He looks at his watch and he says, well, we've already contacted Attorney General Kassenbach, who'd now moved up to be Attorney General. And when the FBI agents arrive, I want you to tell them that in addition to your civil rights being, being violated, you're suing for false arrest. Captain so-and-so, Sergeant so-and-so, Patrolman so-and-so, and so-and-so. -and -so. We were out of there in 40 seconds. Wonderful. That attorney, Vincent Salandria, also happened to be one of the earliest JFK assassination researchers. He picked apart the Warren Commission report and wrote essays refuting the lone gunman theory. Salandria invited Josiah Thompson on his trips to the National Archives in Washington, where they had incredible access to evidence in the case. Thompson even held that Carcano rifle found on the sixth floor of the depository. Push forward round into the chamber, fire. He then purchased the same type of rifle, made at the same Italian factory as Oswald's. A square, you go up and then back, then forward and down. So it, it's a very slow, bold action too. But the big moment for Thompson at the National Archives came when he saw the Zapruder film in motion for the first time. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Remember, the Warren Commission only published still frames from the Zapruder film. The moving video had never been seen in public. Boom, you see. The president's head is thrown backwards and to the left. This elbow comes up until he bounces off the vertical seat cushion forward. What's going through your mind at that point? He got hit from the front. 
This is crazy. We all know that the depository is directly behind him, and this, this is from the front. A shot from the front meant a second gunman, a conspiracy to kill the president. Thompson kept digging with the intention of writing a book, but Life magazine hired him as a researcher for a cover story and sent him to Dallas to investigate. Josiah Thompson looked at this very differently. He examined Dealey Plaza as a crime scene and laser focused his attention on the science of the assassination. He wasn't interested in the bigger picture questions about who was involved. Was it the CIA? Was it the mafia? Thompson was exclusively focused on how many shots were fired and what did those shots do? What's it like being back here after so many years? It's strange. We return to Dealey Plaza in Dallas with Josiah Thompson to retrace his investigation. We know now infinitely more than we knew when I got behind this fence back in August of 1966. What do we know now that we didn't know before? The scenario of the shooting looks quite different than the Warren Commission believed it was. But the various pieces of the scenario fit together in ways they never did before. In 1966, Thompson interviewed key witnesses ignored by the Warren Commission, including Bill Newman, famously captured with his wife, shielding their two young sons on the grassy knoll. They were standing 10 feet away from the president at the time of the fatal shot. And he's the closest witness we have besides the people who are actually in the vehicle, right? Yet the Warren Commission never interviewed. Never interviewed him, right. It's, it's selective. The interviews themselves are somewhat selective because all the agents know what J. Edgar Hoover wants to hear. Oswald did it alone. That's the position of the Bureau. My name's Bill Newman. I'm 80 years old come July the 3rd. And you brought your kids out here that day. Dan, I did. Bill Newman told us what he saw and heard in Dealey Plaza is etched deep into his memory. As the president got maybe some hundred feet from us, the first two shots rang out. It was a boom, boom, like that. And at the time, I thought somebody had thrown a couple of firecrackers against the car, and I thought, well, that's a poor joke to play on the president. And of course, you know, he's all, he come up like that in the seat. And as they got closer to us, you could tell there was something wrong because you could see the blood on Governor Connolly's shirt in the seat and his eyes protruding and President Kennedy was kind of looking into the crowd, it looked to me like. And just as the car passed, it got right in front of us here, the third shot rang out and the side of the President's head had blew off. Newman and his wife threw their boys to the ground and covered them. And I thought that those shots could have been coming right across the top of our heads and then we could have been actually in the line of fire and could have been injured or killed ourselves. Behind Newman on the grass, Cheryl McKinnon was a journalism student when she witnessed the assassination. She later wrote for the San Diego Star News, the only thing that I'm absolutely sure of today is that at least two of the shots fired that day at Dealey Plaza came from behind where I stood on the knoll, not from the book depository. She said, puffs of white smoke still hung in the air in small patches. That would put the gunman who fired the fatal shot at the top of the grassy knoll, near the pergola or behind this stockade fence. It's been rebuilt a few times since the assassination, but the height and dimensions are similar. At the time of the shot, you're 95 feet from the victim. That's close, close in. You're protected from being seen before by the overhanging trees and by these bushes, which at the time were down about, oh, six feet, seven feet. This was uncontrolled. You could get there easily. No one would take note of your license plate or, or of you or anything about it. You were protected. And in five or 10 seconds, you can get away and appear clean. You're safe within five or 10 seconds of the last shot. That's what's amazing. 50 yards behind the stockade fence, Lee Bowers was operating the railroad switching tower. Josiah Thompson took this photo of Bowers' view in 1966. He told investigators he saw two men near the fence at the time of the assassination and a commotion, a flash of light or smoke or something, which caused me to feel like something out of the ordinary had occurred there. 
a railroad supervisor, S.M. Skinny Holland, stood on the overpass above Elm Street with a panoramic view of Dealey Plaza. He was on the overpass because there were one or two Dallas patrolmen assigned there. And they wouldn't let anybody on the overpass because the overpass is going to be over the presidential limousine. So their job was to keep bad people out. Holland told Josiah Thompson as the motorcade headed right at him, he heard four, perhaps five gunshots. And then for the fourth shot, he said, the sound was different. The sound was different like it was difference between a rifle and a 38. Yeah. And then right under these trees here, just out from the trees, maybe eight or 10 feet out, he saw smoke. Holland thought the smoke came from a rifle blast. It wasn't as loud as the first two. It came from my left, from behind a picket fence, and there was a puff of smoke that kind of lingered out uh, under the green trees, right out from that picket fence, about eight or nine feet off the ground. And seven other people did who were on the overpass. They also saw smoke saw from smoke. right here. But the original identification and the original interest in right down here near the corner came from the difference in sound of the shots. Secret Service agent Clint Hill tells us he heard only two shots, that he could have missed one or more shots as he ran to the presidential limousine to help Mrs. Kennedy. You heard the first one which caused the president to put his hands to his neck. And then you heard the one, the fatal shot that affected his head. Um, did those two shots sound different or did they sound the same? They sounded different to me. I think I told the Warren Commission that it sounded like somebody had fired a gun into a can or into a hard surface. And there was some kind of a resounding sound penetrating. I didn't hear that in the first shot. I asked the question because there were some people up on the railroad overpass who reported that that third shot sounded different than the others and that they think it was a different type of gun, a different type of rifle. Does that make sense to you at all? Well, I, I couldn't draw that conclusion because I couldn't specify, you know, what kind, if it was a different kind of gun. But, but it did sound different is what I'm trying to get at. It was a different sound. After the shooting stopped and the limousine sped away to the hospital, some of the spectators and police officers ran up the grassy knoll looking for the assassin. Skinny Holland and three other men ran from the overpass to the stockade fence. And they make their way up here and about eight or ten feet from the corner of the fence, right over there, they find a bunch of footprints. It had rained that morning and cleared about 9.30, so by 12.30 it's per perfectly clear. But the ground was wet. So there are footprints and cigarette butts. And he told you that the footprints looked like a big cat had been pacing back and forth. Back and forth, back and forth. And also there was mud up on the bumper of a car and also the horizontal supports also had mud on them. So mud footprints up on the support right. looking over. Right. Thompson asked Skinny Holland to draw a diagram of the area behind the fence, where he found the footprints and cigarette butts at the trunk of a light tan 1961 Oldsmobile. Then Thompson tried an experiment using a picture taken by witness Mary Mormon, there in the blue jacket, a fraction of a second after the fatal shot to the president. Here's her photograph showing the limousine, the grassy knoll, and the stockade fence. And at one point I said, hey Skinny, look, he was calling me Tink, and I was calling him Skinny by this, by this time. I said, look, I want you to go right to the point where you found the footprints in the mud and where you found the cigarette butts. Uh, the cigarette butts. While Holland stood in that spot, Thompson found where Mary Mormon was standing and snapped this picture. But I knew, wow, because Holland was standing right at the point where this anomalous shape appears in the Mormon photo. Take a look. That's Skinny Holland and his hat standing behind the stockade fence. This is what Thompson calls the anomalous shape in the Mormon photograph. You think that Mormon actually captured the assassin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, think you're, I think you're looking at the top half of the head. I mean, that's incredible. No, but this has gotten better over 50 years, not worse. You'd expect to be some problems with it to show up, no. Thompson also says there is a telling moment on the Dallas police radio, seconds after the assassination. Hospital. 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 
Chief Jesse Curry and Sheriff Bill Decker, riding in the motorcade's lead car, order their staff to investigate the area behind the stockade fence in the railroad yards. As experienced law enforcement, they knew that's the sinister area. That's the place to send my men. Based on that information and more, Thompson published a book that concluded President Kennedy died in a barrage of gunfire. Four shots from three locations in just under six seconds. Along with the Texas School Book Depository and the Grassy Knoll, Thompson wrote one shot came from the roof of the Dallas County Records Building, the only spot that matched the angle of the bullet as it traveled through Governor Connolly's chest. If that's 27 degrees, if I go to the place where Connolly was on Elm Street and look around, what's at 27 degrees? And I found that the roof of the Dallas County Records Building matches exactly at 27 degrees. Josiah Thompson's book, uh, Six Seconds in Dallas, published in 1967, was a seminal work and remains a seminal work on the Kennedy assassination. The nation took notice. The Saturday Evening Post ran a cover story about the book in December 1967 with the headline, Three Assassins Killed Kennedy. Now, Thompson tells us, he wrote Six Seconds based on the best information at the time, but that he had to update the book. Look, I screwed up the scholarship on the Kennedy assassination. I don't think anything about it. <laughs> I'm not the only one. New facts have surfaced that contradict some of what he reported, but also contradict the government position that Lee Harvey Oswald killed the president. Here you can see how the camera movement is once again diagonal. For his first book, Josiah Thompson made a calculation between Zapruder frame 312 and 313, just a fraction of a second. The president's head moved forward 2.16 inches. Well, the only way to make sense of it was to say that he must have been hit in the back of the head. And what we were seeing was the explosion out, out the front. And that was a major mistake. That supported the idea that the fatal shot came from the Texas School Book Depository. Now, he writes, that forward movement was a photographic illusion indicated by these streaks. Zapruder moved his camera, folks. That's why. So it wasn't Kennedy moving. It was, it was the Zapruder camera moving. moving. Right. He was flinching or just. Yeah, he flinched. Right, right. That's wait, wait, the... but, but we held on to that idea that Kennedy's head moved forward for how long? How many oh, years? 30, 40 years. I, yeah, long time. In his book, Thompson also first raised suspicion about what he called the Umbrella Man. This guy is standing right by the Stemmons Freeway sign and pumping the umbrella up and down. At the spot where the first bullet hit the president. On the Zapruder film, you can see the umbrella open on a sunny day. Other cameras across the street also captured the man. Thompson did not speculate about the Umbrella Man's motives, whether he could be part of some plot, but many theories developed after Six Seconds in Dallas came out. One was that he was the signal man. He was raising this umbrella to signal teams of gunmen. The other one, more creatively, has the Umbrella Man firing a paralyzing dart at President Kennedy, which did exist in, in you know, uh, spy, 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 yeah. spy gear at that time, I suppose. I just said in six seconds, I hope this guy will turn up. And so he turned up and testified in Washington with his umbrella. Did the umbrella in your possession on November 22nd, 1963 contain a gun or a weapon of any sort? No. One of the lighter moments of the 1978 assassination hearing when Louis Stephen Witt pulled out the umbrella and explained why he opened it that day. Maybe you ought to turn that way with it. <laughs> 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 and it turns out it was rather a lame political protest, uh, very obscure by today's standards, but essentially Witt was protesting the Kennedy family's uh, support of Neville Chamberlain appeasing Hitler before World War II. British Prime Minister Chamberlain often carried an umbrella. 
Other dead-end theories over the years include this Secret Service agent with a rifle in the motorcade slipped and shot the president, or that a gunman fired from the curb-level storm drain. We checked and the angles don't work out. Historian Stephen Fagan says the conspiracy theories keep getting recycled. They never really go away. They're just sort of there dormant in the background for a while till it's their time to shine again. And then they take center stage to be discussed and debated all over again. The JFK debate slowed somewhat heading into the 1970s until the American public, for the first time, saw the Zapruder film in motion on national television. Well, there was a conspiracy, shots from the front and the rear. On Sundays, Robert Groden sells books and videos in Dealey Plaza on a fold-out table above the grassy knoll. At first glance, you wouldn't know the critical role he played in changing our understanding of the JFK assassination. They brought us the original Zapruder film, handcuffed in an attaché case, the whole thing. He worked as a photo lab technician in New York when Life magazine ordered a copy of the Zapruder film in a larger format. Suffice to say, an extra copy got made they didn't know about. That they didn't know about? They didn't know about. That's the one I released on national television in 1975. Life published only still frames of the Zapruder film. Americans hadn't seen the assassination unfold on that brutal home movie. After Grodin brought the film to a symposium in Boston, Geraldo Rivera asked him to show it on ABC's Goodnight America. If you're at all queasy, uh, then don't watch this film. Just put on the, uh, the late night movie, uh, because this is uh, very heavy. Rivera asked Grodin to narrate. When he comes out from behind the sign, he is shot, and then Governor Connolly is shot. He's already been hit. He's already been hit. And now? And at the bottom of the screen, the head shot. That's the shot that blew off his head. It's the most horrifying thing I've ever seen in the movies. Now, Jackie doesn't realize what's happened yet. She goes to his aid. And now? He's hit Again, the violent backward motion, totally consistent with 80% of the witnesses, which said the shot came from the grassy knoll in front and to the right. Contradicting the official story that the president died because of a lone gunman firing from behind. Releasing the Zapruder film gave the public the chance to see the truth. It was amazing. The, the outcry, the public outcry was incredible. It had enormous impact. It created a kind of tsunami of, of concern and outrage in the American public. The response to the program was so great that Geraldo Rivera devoted the entire next episode of Goodnight America to the Zapruder film. The lead guest? It's called, as you can see, I hope, Six Seconds in Dallas. Professor Thompson, welcome. Thank you. Josiah Thompson picking apart the magic bullet theory that a single shot inflicted seven wounds on President Kennedy and Governor Conley. This and is the actual bullet that they found. That's the actual bullet, the bullet that was supposed to have done all this. On either end are ballistic comparison bullets that were fired into cotton by the FBI. These went into cotton. According to the commission, this went through two people, smashed two large bones and it looks virtually undamaged. The commission actually performed experiments to see what would happen to bullets fired from Oswald's rifle when they hit bone. That's a bullet fired from Oswald's rifle that was fired into a, a corpse's wrist, grossly deformed as one would expect. All these bullets that hit anything were grossly deformed. And yet this bullet allegedly went through two people and smashed two large bones. And I submit that that's just profoundly improbable. The showing of the Zapruder film on ABC led to the House Select Committee on Assassinations in 1976. They reopened the Kennedy case. Robert Grodin fielded requests from members of Congress to see the film. And the question that was asked again and again is, why weren't we ever allowed to see this? And the answer is Life Magazine was suppressing it. Did they suppress it, or was it also part of a government suppression? Well, they did it for some reason. On their own, I have no idea why they would spend a quarter of a million dollars on a piece of film and I use it. The Committee on Assassinations tried to explain what was so apparent to the American public. The president's head moved back and to the left after the fatal shot. 
They considered the jet effect proposed by UC Berkeley physicist Louis Alvarez. He said, after the bullet struck the president from behind, the pressure of blood and brain matter leaving the exit wound pushed the head back. Alvarez tried to prove the jet effect at a San Leandro rifle range by shooting melons wrapped with tape, a pineapple, rubber balls, and a plastic jug filled with jello, but failed. Okay, now the bullet has come in from the left. For the House Select Committee, Army technicians shot 10 human skulls filled with gelatin and wrapped in goatskin with hair intact to simulate a scalp. All of them moved in the direction of the bullet, disproving the jet effect. The head of the president would uh, probably go with the bullet. Then, wound ballistics expert Larry Sturdivant hypothesized that a neuromuscular spasm caused the president's movement, as seen in bullet tests on goats he played from 1948. Some panel members seemed less than impressed. In terms of tests such as this, in order to reach conclusions, uh, 30 years ago, that I presume that we've, I presume we've advanced uh, scientifically in this area. Well, yes. Um... Still, the committee issued a draft report supporting the Warren Commission. They support the single bullet theory that one shot hit both Kennedy and Connolly. They support the idea of three shots fired by Lee Harvey Oswald from the sixth floor window of the school book depository. Deeply disappointing to critical researchers and theorists out there who, who really expected a different conclusion. Then a stunning development. A recording from Channel One of the Dallas police radio system surfaced. A motorcycle in the presidential motorcade had its microphone stuck in the open position during the assassination. After an officer's words, I'll check it, acoustics experts found a series of gunshots. The sounds of gunfire did in fact occur at the same time as the assassination. The committee hired acoustics expert James Barger, best known for pinpointing the location of National Guard gunfire during the Kent State shootings. In August of 1978, Barger directed another reenactment in Dealey Plaza, this time with an array of 36 microphones and test shots fired from the school book depository and the grassy knoll. We did it and we got 2,600 different combinations of shooter locations, target positions, and microphones picking up the echo patterns from those, those shots. The waveforms from the reenactment matched the police recording. Barger reported to the Select Committee on Assassinations that a shot did come from the grassy knoll. Uh, that one uh, appears to have emanated from here, and that is well within that angle. In other words, that shockwave will come right by and, and hit it. What is the probability uh, that that loud noise from the grassy knoll was in fact a rifle shot? To answer your question, literally I'd have to say my estimate is about 78% likely to be a rifle. Okay. The firing point right there, right where this shape appears in the Mormon film right where Holland found the footprints and the cigarette butts. So it all comes together. That's an example of what I mean by the evidence slowly over time beginning to fall more and more together. Using the timing from the police motorcycle recording, the committee had its consultant, Robert Groden, lay the sound of the test shots onto the Zapruder film and play it during the hearing. Could I have the lights off, please? A bit difficult for us to see with the room's lights out, but James Barger told us everyone there was stunned. All of a sudden it went bang, bang. And I looked, I saw that, and the first bang, of course, was from the knoll, and the second one from the depository. I saw that, and I thought, boy, did I ever get this one right. Here, we recreate the test shots married to the Zapruder film, following one of two scenarios proposed by the commission, that the fatal shot came from the grassy knoll.
the committee's other version shows the shot from the knoll misses and the fatal shot comes from the school book depository building. Barger told us that's not as convincing. In the end, the House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded there was a conspiracy to kill the president, and a shot did come from the grassy knoll, but that it missed. The committee's chief counsel, Robert Blakey. The forensic pathological panel simply says that if he was shot out from the front and to the right, the shot missed. Well, why did they come to that conclusion? This was too rich for Robert Blakey's blood. Namely, how can I, I can't say that. How can our committee say that? That means this was a professional hit. It was too hot to touch. It was too hot. This was a professional hit then that, that we've concealed for 12 years. If it misses, then... Then, three years later, a panel from the National Academy of Sciences, which included physicist Louis Alvarez of Jet Effect fame, concluded the police radio recordings did not prove a shot came from the grassy knoll. They compared the Channel 1 tape to Channel 2 and found crosstalk, clips of words from officers that day. A particular instance of what they called crosstalk showed that the sound impulses they took to be gunshots had actually occurred about 60 seconds after the shooting was over. They concluded the recordings from that police motorcycle were useless to the investigation, that they did not record the assassination after all. And I uh, told them I thought they were wrong, and uh, they told me they thought I was wrong, and I said, I'm sure you're wrong, and they said, well, we're sure you're wrong, and that kind of stuff. And really, after the National Academy of Sciences study in 1982 comes out saying that it doesn't support a, a grassy knoll shot, in fact, those impulses might not even be sounds of gunfire or likely not sounds of gunfire, the acoustics evidence really goes away for over 20 years. The most compelling argument that a conspiracy killed the president starts to fade. But Josiah Thompson wasn't done yet. After Josiah Thompson published his first book on the Kennedy assassination in 1967, he went on to a remarkable career as a private detective, with high-profile cases including the bombing of the Oklahoma City Federal Building, the San Quentin Six, inmates who tried to escape the legendary prison and sparked a deadly riot, the Skyhorse Mohawk case, one of the longest murder trials in California history that found Native American activists not guilty in the death of a Los Angeles cab driver. His thoughts often returned to Dealey Plaza, and a decade ago, he decided to take one last run at the JFK assassination. After I started working as a, as a detective, I applied that to the Kennedy case. And I said, uh, what question do you want to answer? And I said, was this a professional hit that is part of politics, or was it an amateur assassination? Thompson networked with a group of civilians who bring their own life experience and passion to the investigation, so-called assassination buffs, including Dr. Gary Aguilar, an ophthalmologist and former trauma surgeon from San Francisco. I'm one of the few physicians outside the government ever allowed by the Kennedy family to see the still restricted autopsy photographs uh, and uh, x-rays of Jack Kennedy uh, taken at Bethesda after he was assassinated. Some less clear versions of the president's x-rays are available online, but not the originals. To see them, you have to get permission from the Kennedys. I've had a fair amount of experience uh, with skull x-rays and that sort of thing, and plus I'd published something in the Journal of American Medical Association on the Kennedy case, and so with that background, you would then would applied, and I applied to the then family attorney, Brooke Marshall, and he said, okay, you can see the original autopsy materials, and I saw them on two different occasions. On the original x-rays of the president's brain, Dr. Aguilar saw what he calls a snow trail of tiny lead particles that would not come from the type of ammunition Oswald used, a military-style jacketed bullet, a lead core wrapped in copper. 
when a jacketed bullet hits a skull, it breaks into small fragments, but because of the jacket, the, the lead inside does not disperse into tiny little fragments. When you use a soft pointed hunting round, it flattens on impact and it breaks up into tiny little fragments and the fragments don't go very far. A snowstorm of lead doesn't come from, a, can't come from a military jacketed bullet, but comes from an ordinary lead hunting round. So all, all this fits together. A second type of bullet, a hunting round, would mean a second assassin. Remember, several witnesses reported the shot that killed the president sounded different than the others, including that Secret Service agent running to the limousine just feet away at the critical moment. Did those two shots sound different or did they sound the same? They sounded different to me. Thompson next revisited the sound of gunfire captured by that open microphone on a Dallas police motorcycle tuned to Channel One. In 1982, the National Academy of Sciences disputed that recording. They compared it to Channel 2 of the police radio that day and ruled what sounded like gunfire actually happened 60 seconds after the assassination. That particular report has been believed for about 30 years. It was wrong. It was wildly wrong. For his new book, Thompson contacted the scientist who initially confirmed the recording as authentic, that the motorcycle's open microphone caught the sounds of the assassination. James Barger led the acoustics recreation in Dealey Plaza in 1978 for the House Select Committee on Assassinations. I hate to see what I know darn well is well-documented good science cast aside by, um, well, bad science. Barger happily came out of retirement after Thompson's call and worked for the past several years with an old colleague, engineer Richard Mullen, analyzing the radio recordings. And he found out, yes, the Channel 2 tape had been overdubbed, it had been cut by measuring the hum frequencies very carefully. If you had several hum frequencies, this meant that it went through several different electronic devices in, in becoming what it was. The Channel 2 recording was not an original as the government contended, and someone spliced or edited the tape. The National Academy of Sciences made a mistake using the Channel 2 recording to refute the sounds of gunfire heard on Channel 1. There's a kind of elegant simplicity now to what happened. It was before when I tried to figure this out, it was kind of jumbled. It was difficult to see how the different pieces all fit together. Now that the motorcycle recording stands as authentic, Josiah Thompson has synchronized it to the Sapruder film and calculated the gunfire came at frames 175, 204, 224, 313, and 328. Oswald's rifle could not reload fast enough to fire all those shots. The fastest time you could fire the right rifle was 2.3 seconds. And that was adopted by the Warren Commission as a minimum mechanical firing time of the rifle. The first three shots occur in just 2.75 seconds. There's a miss. President Kennedy hit in the neck. You see him react as he clears the Stemmons freeway sign. Then Governor Connolly is shot. Connolly's turning and very suddenly you see the lapel of his coat flip out and he lifts his, his hat up. You see Conley's face contort in pain. Then a break in the gunfire for 4.81 seconds until the limousine reaches the grassy knoll. Kennedy got hit from somebody right over there above the right temple. He was thrown backwards into the left and then three quarters of a second after that he was hit by a second shot from the depository. Josiah Thompson writes in his new book, Last Second in Dallas, after that fatal shot from the knoll, you can see the president's head suffer even more damage as the final bullet from the book depository pushed him forward. Technically, he was not killed by Oswald. We know that. What we do know is that Lee Harvey Oswald was not behind the, the stockade fence on the knoll. And that particular wound was so grievous. The final piece of the puzzle, 
two distinct debris fields, divergent trails of blood and bone and brain, proving at least two shooters conspired to kill the president. Dr. Doug DeSales had a long career as an urgent care physician, but he is a lifelong JFK assassination buff. I think there's a lot of people like myself whose attitude is just, damn it, I want to know. I want to know what the hell really happened. And I don't know that we ever will know, truly, all the details of that. I'm, sh I'm certain we will not, but I think that uh, we, may, we may get close enough to truth to be satisfied. He built models to plot bullet trajectories performed gunshot tests to refute government theories. We took some cantaloupes, put casting plaster this time to put a harder surface around it. Checked the firing speed of the type of rifle used by Lee Harvey Oswald. But his most important contribution may be this, his study of where blood, bone, and brain matter traveled during that last second. The shot came from the front that did what we're talking about, but that within a second, a second bullet also struck. When you put these two datas, data streams together, all of a sudden, a lot of things fall in place. Dr. DeSales analyzed the Zapruder film and four other home movies taken at that time. He plotted the location of everyone in the president's limousine, the Secret Service car following closely behind, and four police motorcycles just off to either side. The first of the final two gunshots came from the grassy knoll and spread blood, bone, and brain matter in the same direction to the left and rear. Kennedy gets hit, gets thrown to the left rear, all the impact debris goes to the left rear, and then three quarters of a second later, he gets hit again, goes forward, all the impact debris goes forward, covering the limousine. So you had two specific debris fields. Yeah, but they're simple. The same thing happens in both. Kennedy's head, when hit, goes along the trajectory of the bullet, the, the flight line of the bullet. First evidence of that, Secret Service agent Clint Hill jumped from the follow-up car and almost made it to the president's limousine when the fatal shot came from the grassy knoll. It sent debris all over Hill. It was just like an eruption. Blood, brain matter, bone fragments, everything you can imagine, you know, come, up come out of the head. Then Jacqueline Kennedy climbed on the trunk of the limousine, reaching for pieces of her husband's skull sent backwards by the blast. She at that time had come up on the back of the trunk trying to recover some of the material that came out of the president's head, and she actually did get a hold of some of it. Next in line, the motorcycle officer riding to the left of the limousine's bumper, Bobby Harges. In addition to blood and brain, a piece of skull struck him with such force that he thought it was a bullet. He gets the major blast of that. He gets hit so hard that he said, I thought I'd been shot. Boom, right, in the chest. Hargis dropped his motorcycle and ran in what he believed to be the direction of the gunfire, the grassy knoll. On the Zapruder film, two pieces of bone appear to fly up and to the left. A sheriff's deputy recovered one piece from the gutter, 10 feet to the left of the limousine's path. And the next day, a college student found this two-inch chunk of the president's skull in the grass to the left of Elm Street. The FBI said it was 25 feet away from where Kennedy's head would have been at the time. The other motorcycle officer on the left of the limousine, Billy Martin, reported the blood hit his windshield, the left side of his helmet, and the left side of his uniform. His right side was clean. So you would expect him to get hit with most of the impact debris here on the right side. No, he had none. I kept wondering, why? Well, dummy, the point is that he's in the rain shadow, as it were, of, of Hargis. Hargis took the main blast and shielded him on his right side. Debris from the president's head also reached the Secret Service car following close behind. But all this material, blood, brain, bone fragments came out of the wound and just all over everything that got on the car, the follow-up car. The Secret Service agent who's driving the car behind, which is like five feet you know, behind the bumper, he said I had blood on my left arm and it was all over my windshield. Now to the second debris field. Just three quarters of a second after the shot from the grassy knoll, the final shot from the Texas School Book Depository hit President Kennedy, sending debris forward. We know for a fact there was blood on the front of that limousine. Governor Conley said as he was, you know, laying in the seat, when the blow struck, debris blew over the top of them. 
obviously coming from the rear. The FBI also found blood on the back of the Secret Service agent driving the limousine and the agent in the front passenger seat. Blood on the inside of the windshield and as far forward as the hood ornament. Physics determines how particles of blood and brain move. It's not somebody's opinion, it's a known fact. And that's why to base basically this reconstruction of the last second on that and then see how it links to all the witness reports, wraps it up into, into a pattern that, that really is persuasive. Two bullet fragments landed in the front seat area after apparently cracking the windshield, leaving a lead smear on the glass and a dent in the chrome strip above it. One other crucial argument, why would the motorcycle officers on the left become showered with debris, but not the motorcycle officers on the right? Kennedy's in this position in the limousine, in the right corner. So you would expect if he was hit from the rear, that goes in the rear and blows out the, the right top of his head, Cheney, who is right here, would have received a lot of impact debris. Uh-uh, none, zero, nada. Officers Jim Cheney and Douglas Jackson on the right side were clean. Now, if you're shot from a position almost directly behind you and you're hit on the right side, you're hard pressed to explain why is it the men on the left were struck and the, the two officers on the right were not. I mean, how do you explain that? One final question. We know police arrested Lee Harvey Oswald just 80 minutes after the assassination of President Kennedy. How did the grassy Noel gunman get away? Josiah Thompson has a theory. At 86 years of age, Josiah Thompson has finished his life's work on the John F. Kennedy assassination. And here, after 55 years, all the pieces are finally in place. In a case where complexity grows with every passing year, its very center exhibits a quiet simplicity. He ends his new book, Last Second in Dallas, imagining how the final moments of the plot to kill the president played out. On the knoll, the gunman behind the fence may have noticed the car slowing as he squeezed the trigger. After the barrage of gunfire, Lee Harvey Oswald calmly walked from the Texas School Book Depository, Coca-Cola in hand. And the man who actually fired the fatal shot from behind the stockade fence had his own getaway plan. His car was parked there undoubtedly. Well, he had the trunk open, he threw the gun in the trunk, closed it. That would take maybe five seconds. Then he's just a bystander. In other words, there's no reason to arrest him. Dallas traffic officer Joe Marshall Smith thought the shots came from behind the stockade fence. He ran there, said he caught the smell of gunpowder, and confronted a man wearing a sports shirt. When the man flashed Secret Service credentials, Officer Smith let him go, but later said the man had dirty fingernails, like an auto mechanic's hands, and afterwards it didn't ring true for the Secret Service. Later, the Secret Service confirmed they had no agents in the area at the time. Josiah Thompson believes that could have been the assassin, the same blurry figure in that photograph, the one spotted pacing near the stockade fence by the worker in the railroad switching tower, so close to catching the killer. A cordon was established by police around the parking lot here and up to the depository. But as soon as Oswald was picked up in the Texas theater, the cordon was released and everybody could come and take the car away. Trunks were never searched. The trunks weren't searched? No. And they didn't have license plates or no, any no, record of who had parked here? took license plates. Thompson writes that the Knoll shooter pitched the rifle into the trunk and either climbed in after it or walked away. Either he or his companion closed the lid and walked away from the car where either might have become the Secret Service agent Officer Smith later encountered, the one with the dirty fingernails. That afternoon or evening, long after the cordon around the area had been lifted by the Dallas police, someone returned and drove the car away. I think we gotta, gotta review our history now in seeing that this was a professional hit. I don't know what one does with that, that's not my job. 
I just wanted to find out what happened. And what I found happened was a professional hit. But just as, a, as an investigator, doesn't that kind of drive you nuts? Don't you want to know the why? And who else was involved? <laughs> Many people have disappeared down that road and never been seen again, right? Of course, sure, I'd like to know, but I don't. I don't.